Major funding for Talk of the Town, Architects Mark and Nada Brightman is provided by the University of Notre Dame School of Architecture through the generous support of the Richard H. Driehaus Charitable Lead Trust. Comme je vous l'ai expliqué tout à l'heure, quand ça frémit comme ça, c'est que là on est dans une température parfaite, entre 230 et 250 degrés, plus ou moins. A boiling kettle of roofing tar. The perfect temperature for gigo bitume. What's gigo bitume? For French construction workers, it's a very special lunch. C'est une tradition du bâtiment en France, une tradition française qui date d'il y a très longtemps. Gigo bitume translates as lamb cooked in boiling tar. On goûte le bitume Pas du tout. Pas du tout Non, non. Si vous voulez aller à l'hôpital, allez-y. Il <laughs> n'y a pas de problème. Mais moi, j'en porte pas la responsabilité. Hein. Uh. <laughs> This gathering is a celebration for construction workers and their bosses. It marks the completion of a building's exterior in a small town outside of Paris called Le Plessis Robinson. The hosts are the building's architects, Mark and Nada Brightman. Gigo bitume is done with all the material of the site. So we use a tar, it's a hot tar. They use a paper we use for covering the windows. So we, they put the gigot inside into the paper, and then with the steel, they put the lame in the boiling tar, and it, it, uh, it cuit, uh, it cooks. Is that Chicago, or is that Yves de la Cité? <laughs> gigot bitume was largely a lost tradition when the Brightmans rediscovered it. The first time we have the first project, I heard about the tradition of making a fiesta when the mason are leaving. So on each project, we ask to the guy to organize this little fiesta. As we all dig in, it's easy to see that the Brightmans truly savor tradition. It's delicious. The Brightmans are architects with a knack for transforming struggling communities into charming traditional towns. They've been working in La Placy Robinson since the early 1990s. The suburb is home to the French military police, the Gendarmerie. So here, it's military area. This is military housing? Yes, military area. But it was the first time that military area was living like if they were living on the street. We have done a street with a sidewalk and with trees and with a, a lights. Le Plessis Robinson was not a town known for its welcoming streets. Its modernist apartment blocks were scattered across the landscape. You take a box of dominoes and you put it on the ground and it fall on the ground and you have those blocks and the mayor decide to transform this residential area. C'est vrai qu'ils m'ont euh, aidé à dessiner la ville, ils m'ont aidé à concevoir la ville d'aujourd'hui de, 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 et euh, à imaginer les choses euh, autrement qu'elles étaient. Euh, C'est vrai que j'ai découvert cette problématique d'architecture et, et d'urbanisme et j'ai compris à quel point ça pouvait avoir de l'importance sur la qualité de vie des gens, bien évidemment. Above all, Mayor Philippe Pemizek and the Brightmans shared a desire to erase the distinction between private housing and subsidized or social housing. Et donc, ce que je veux aussi, c'est que tout le monde ait droit à la même architecture, que tout le monde ait droit au beau. This is private this over is here. This is private. Uh -huh. Instead of those ones who are social. Social housing. Those are social and those are social. It all looks the same. If you build something, it should be uh, uh, the, the, the equal quality for everyone. So the facade of the building has to show something else than rich or poor. It has to say something more, more intellectual, more poetic. The Brightmans went to town, creating a whole town. An old soccer field became the town center. An aging school building became part of a new educational campus. 
but not everyone approved. A very famous newspaper whose name is Liberation, at the end of the year, always make a page of the stupid thing happening during the year. Like the Brightman's housing project. Because it was not modern. And that was the beginning of our success because everybody was looking at the houses who were looking normal, uh, traditional, and everybody said, well, it's absolutely fantastic. <laughs> Can you do this for social housing? Yes. In Cheville, a small town along the historic Royal Road between Paris and Versailles, the Brightmans faced a big design problem. We enter Cheville, we go by car, and then suddenly we saw Cheville so finished. I say, well, we missed something. Where is the center? <laughs> we came back, we tried uh, again, Cheville out. So OK, there is no center. <laughs> they created Cheville's new town center, the Grand Place. So people live on the square. They live here, and, and they go to buy their wine there, buy the bread here. And we try to make mixity everywhere. I also see what you're trying to do. It doesn't look like one building. It looks like many buildings. Yes, it's like in the city. Each building got its own composition. And like that, even the people can say, I am living in the pink one, where there is a little balcony. We have a little theory that architecture is the, the, the daughter of the city. So when we do a project in architecture, there is an idea of city back our architecture. Don't we walk on the sidewalk? No, always on the road. You walk in the street? Yeah, the, the, the car has to wait. Okay. <laughs> the Brightman's love of traditional cities is easy to understand when you follow them home. You are in the heart of Paris. I never met somebody who said that here was not beautiful. Everybody finds it beautiful. Me too. I'm very simple. I like. The name of the neighborhood, which is the Saint Germain des Prés. I go left and I go to the bar where all the intellectual painters were living. It was the, the, the atelier of uh, Picasso. And so there is the spirit of all this yet in the district. I think it's very important that in all the cities there is a mixity, diversity. This is the quality of the cities and it gives liberty, free. These come from your favorite uh, yes, pastry uh, shop? Wow. The wow. Brightman's life is rooted in this neighborhood of old, intimate spaces. <laughs> this area, we try to finish the 1930 architecture mm -hmm. for beginning from here, a classical place, square. In addition to their office, they have an atelier around the corner where nearly a dozen young architects work to realize their designs. And there is another office just there, where we draw and write, without phone. With no, no phone. No phone. Yeah, no yes. interruptions. It's the place where we, we have some, we try to think something intelligent. In here. Hidden behind this massive old door, in a corner of an interior courtyard, is their third working space, which the Brightmans call the studio. It's filled with reminders of Marx's days as an architecture student at Paris's famed École des Beaux-Arts. It was very expensive to buy Architecture d'Aujourd'hui, which was a very famous review for architecture, and it cost more than the old book of architecture. I discovered like that beautiful old book from the 19th century. 1847, yes. Yeah. Cheap and beautiful. Modern and ancient monuments, yeah. And modern. And modern, right. And I begin a big collection about those books because architecture is an obsession. Mm -hmm. When I see those drawings, I'm suffering because I would have liked to build this type of architecture. You would have liked to but build But nobody gave me the money to build a stone <laughs> building like this. Maybe, maybe someday. Maybe someday, I would like to. Sometimes you open the book and you find a little drawing of the, ah yes it is, here. So I keep it on the same place. Look at that. And it's a little aquarelle, a uh, watercolor, done by the guy who, who was the owner. This book yes, in the 1800s. Yes. What a treasure to I just. I will add one of mine. At L'Ecole des Beaux-Arts, Marc found himself at odds with the dominant strain of teaching at the time, modernism. 
At the beginning, I was learning like every student are. And uh, in a few years, I discovered that I had a problem with modernism and no problem with classical architecture and urbanism. In modernism, there is no idea of urban culture. There is only the idea to make provocation between one building to the another, to be different, always, always different. After graduation, he faced a required nine-month military service. Instead, he negotiated an assignment teaching architecture in Tunisia, a former French colony. But I was most interested in traditional architecture in Tunisia, so with the students, we organized a big relevé, a hasem, to make the inventory of their area in their town. So in four years, we have made the inventory of all the, the Tunisian urban spaces. In Tunisia, Mark observed firsthand the ways tradition, culture, and architecture intersect. In Tunisia, they decide to make new houses with windows on the street. That seemed for you normal. That seemed for me normal. But in the traditional culture, the windows are inside in a courtyard. Mm -hmm. And they reorganized completely the house. And on the street, the, the house was completely closed. Mark and Nada's own home, just a short walk from their Paris offices, is carved out of a centuries-old alley and a printer's shop, perfectly embodying what they value. Nada grew up with a mother who loved history and a father who was an architect. This is a book I did for my father at the end of his life. He had a very uh, different career than uh, we have done with Mark, of course. But he was um, very uh, more, uh, you say, modernist, and he make always uh, nice drawings. As you can see, uh, we are nothing in common as for the style. <laughs> My father would be so happy to live in America, for example. For him, it was the ideal way of life. Everything by cars and the shopping center and the garden and the barbecue. But our life was totally different. I mean, we, we like to walk, we like to go to the cafe, we like to have a, a social life, and then you have the feeling of the pleasant city. For Nada, her hometown of Brussels was the pleasantest of cities. You always love the place where you was born and you spend your youth. Slowly, they destroy blocks after blocks, and they destroy the spirit of many districts in Brussels. My father used to say, well, we can keep the Grand Place, but uh, nothing has any value. Well, we had some fight about this question. <laughs> Nada pursued her love of traditional architecture at an art and design school in Brussels, La Combre. They were all artists and architects together. La Combre was a hotbed of resistance to the post-war remaking of Brussels' historic neighborhoods, where international institutions like NATO were putting up new modernist buildings. In response, students did everything from protesting to creating political theater. We were very militant. <laughs> For example, I make a, a contre-project to do a traditional block. A book filled with the students' counter-projects was published, and Nada found a calling as a writer. She was making beautiful books in this period. I, I meet him uh, at, uh, working. <laughs> I met her in uh, an institution whose name was Institut Français d'Architecture. Et voilà. Together, they fought to preserve a neighborhood in Paris next to the popular district of Montmartre, La Goutte d'Or. Its residents were mostly working class North African immigrants, making it an easy target for redevelopment. So we decided to make a book to defend this area that we show by this book the quality of the architecture. And we lose. And we lose, and we lose, and it cost us a lot of bad reputation in Paris. We have a terrible press against us. Undeterred, Mark and Nada moved forward. They were among dozens of architects involved in an ambitious project to redevelop the war-torn medieval city of Amiens. The project we propose is the new area. This is new construction. This is new construction. It, it is a proposal. The mayor uh, lose the election 
and the new one said it was not his idea. Local politics killed the project, but the unrealized plans led to their big break. There was an exhibition in Amiens mm -hmm. with all the drawing, with the watercolors we have done, the facade and all the space. And the mayor of one of those cities who saw the exhibition said, I want to meet those architects. The mayor was from a town in the former coal mining region of northern France. When you are a French Parisian, you don't know very much about the north of France, but we discover it with this project and we fall in love with the people of uh, this area and with this strange landscape. Ah, it's absolutely incredible. With a very strange light, because the north of France, the light is metallic, cold, marvelous. It is terrible and it is also marvelous. Man-made mountains of coal mine waste loom over the landscape. In the towns, street after street of repetitive row houses all lead in one direction, to the mine. What is that thing? C'est un chevalement, cher Geoffrey. Un chevalement, c'est l'endroit où tout simplement descendent les mineurs dans la mine. Donc ici, vous êtes au cœur d'un bassin minier, le plus grand bassin minier de France. You have to imagine that this area before was rural, very sweet. And when they discover that there was coal downstairs, it becomes black with mountains of coke, with terrible machines, industrial machines, who transform completely the, the paysage, who were very like, uh, I don't know, uh, Walt Disney paysage, you know, with a little <laughs> <laughs> finished. Black, terrible, industrial, enormous. All of Europe and all of the Industrial Revolution was based on coal. So we have there essentially an industrial archaeology, we call it. The region was so important that UNESCO named it a World Heritage Site. It doesn't have artistic value, but it has a very important historical value, and this is a value that we recognize. But coal was on the way out in France. In 2004, after 300 years, the country shuttered its coal industry. Towns in the region faced unemployment rates as high as 50 percent. Civic leaders believed the Brightman's approach to urban design could bring new life to the area. This is absolutely social housing with a very small budget. The Brightman's have created entire new districts in towns like Courier while preserving their historic character. Courier had known hardship long before the mines closed. In 1906, it was the site of Europe's worst mining disaster, an explosion that killed more than a thousand people. Il y avait toujours la peur de l'accident. Rares étaient les mineurs qui dépassait l'âge moyen de 50 ans. Your father and your grandfather worked in the mines. Yes. Mon père et mon grand-père maternel et paternel et c'est la raison que mon père ne voulait à aucun prix aucun prix que ses enfants travaillent à la mine. This is a very unlucky area also because it's it's been hit by two wars. The land is full of trenches, cemeteries. I mean, it's not a happy land. Happy or not, generations of mine workers called it home. Quand la mine ferme, c'est naturellement un drame pour l'ensemble du bassin minier. Comment les gens vont pouvoir continuer à se soigner? Comment les gens vont-ils pouvoir continuer à loger? Et puis, Il y a la question majeure, c'est celle du patrimoine minier. Les logements miniers, que vont-ils 
donc devenir dans le futur. So they ask us to think what can we do to transform those blocks. And we propose them to, transf to transform those, those blocks in a piece of uh, urban quartier. Here's how that transformation looks in the town of Bruet, La Buissière. Our goal was to build houses for the same scale as the minor house uh, before, but uh, in changing just a little uh, details for cornice or for the, the colors of the facade and to just break the, the line, you know, this endless line of houses uh, uh, going uh, in the, the landscape. And we make big blocks. And we make streets, we make square places. Using the existing housing and adding new buildings to make private and public spaces. And the corner house, of course. La Maison d'Angle starts to be the way of making blocks shorter. Then we make a rounds place, which is the opening of the new district, with apartments. The effect is that they love us. They said, ah, they are the architect. And we, we say, come, come in my home. And we are always drunk when we get out. <laughs> because they always want <laughs> Have you ever seen public housing done by, by a classical architect? You've never seen it. This is the only one. And they look at the place. They're not looking for a style. They're not looking for you know, expressing a uh, special design of their own. The Brightmans are really interested in the context. Overall, they were able to create a new language for public housing. I think it's a major achievement. We built, I think, in more than 20 or 30 towns, because all the Maya around were the same, and we design urban space everywhere. Now, after 20 years, we have done uh, many many parts of those cities. Nada and Marc nous ont apporté un geste architectural dont nous n'avions pas l'habitude. This neighborhood in Amsterdam is much smaller than the vast coal country of northern France, but the challenge it presented to the Breitmans was maybe even bigger. It's a very long story because it begins more than 15 years ago. We all had a lot of patience, yes. A group of Turkish immigrants wanted to build a mosque on the site of a large garage they'd purchased. They banded together in the face of opposition from neighbors, unions, and even city officials. So they asked a fantastic guy whose name is Frank Badendijk, one of the most important builders for social housing in Holland, to make the negotiation between the city and the Turkish. I thought at that moment, that the citizens of Amsterdam should integrate. So begin a secret negotiation. I had promised the local authorities to construct the most beautiful mosque in the western of Europe. To sweeten the deal, Bidendijk proposed surrounding the mosque with a new public square and social housing. And he knew just the architects for the project. What we could do is not only build a mosque, but offer to the city of Amsterdam a new square. I think it's a good idea to have a plaza in a neighborhood where there are only long streets. And because the mosque is oriented on the east, and because she is on a longer canal, we use the difference of the geometry to make arcades to get continuity with the urban space of the canal. So Bidendijk called up the mayor. I said, Henk, uh, Frank here, I think I can solve a problem for you and for the Turks as well. The Turkish community got a beautiful house of worship steeped in centuries-old tradition. I learn a lot in Tunisia. There is a very strong relationship between the organization of the space and the culture of the people. So respecting this organization, I'm sure that I respect the culture. It's based on traditional design principles. The famous Turkish architect Sinan, who has worked in the 15th century in Turkey, and who found, you could say, the size and the form of a real mosque. And beyond the mosque, 
Amsterdam got a new neighborhood built on the principles of diversity that have worked so well in the Breitman's other projects. Principles they live every day back home in Paris. I'm a normal guy. All my life is on urban pace and architecture. I believe in mixity and complexity because in complexity you got harmony and you got pleasure. Everybody comes in Saint Germain des Prés because they see an organization who looks like a little village and you can have a drink on the terrace, you drink a glass of, of wine, and next go to the boutique to buy a piece of bread, and next to go to work in your little industry, and you live upstairs on the second floor. So there is a mixity of function, and it is a pleasure of life to do all those things in the same place. <laughs> it is very simple. At the end, I have the impression to tell you something you know very well. It is very simple. Major funding for Talk of the Town, Architects Mark and Nada Brightman, is provided by the University of Notre Dame School of Architecture through the generous support of the Richard H. Driehaus Charitable Lead Trust.